Hello and welcome to Making Mannequin Heads into Planters, episode 40 something. I'm not sure what episode this is, but it is 40 something. Ha <laughs> ha, love it. Um, so, very exciting. We're coming along with um, Spike over here. And um, the last time we were together, I put the yellow or the bright orange over the red. And I'm going to be doing one more color with that on the opposite sides um, or on, you know, one side. I'm going to be shading and then um, where needed, like in the front, I won't actually need except for down through here and under here. And then we're going to continue painting the spikes. I'm really liking the spikes, the way they're coming out with that metallic. Oops, let's see if I can get you some light. There it is. Do you see them? That's cool. I love it. Here, let me bring this light up. There it is. Wow. That's very bright. Ah. Oh my God. Hello. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look at that. Look at that. So we'll definitely put the orange on the ends, brown on the bottom, then come up to the sand color, brown sugar. We'll start with coffee bean at the base, brown sugar in the middle. And then we'll go to uh, the pumpkin patch as the very tips, the flat tips. But before that we get to that, we are doing the metallic bright brass. So those are the four colors that we're working on. We're working with the bright brass is this one, uh, deco art, dazzling metallics. Ha <laughs> um, So exciting, oh my God. And then the up, uh, hello, there it is. And the other um, three colors that we're going with are American Americana Multi-Surface Satin. Whatever that is. There it is, but you can't see it once you're that far away. <laughs> All right, sound good. And I'm gonna take this down a notch because good golly, that is blindingly bright. So I figured I'd try to help myself out with a little bit better lighting. Um, we'll see if this works, how well this works or if it works at all, or if I'm just kind of blinded the entire time, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so which way are we going with that? That's going that way so you can see my colors and we'll see how well this works. All right, so always tweaking, always trying to make it a little bit better for my people, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so let's go with what shall we do first? What shall we do first? <laughs> I do have the orange on top of the red. If we go with the deeper red. So I think, I don't remember which one I was, I thought I was using Red Barn, but I have a brighter red that's actually lipstick. Um, maybe we'll go with a brighter red. There's also, oh, I have two of them. Here's a purpley red. Ooh, that's kind of pretty. Look at here. See that one? Whatever that is. See it? The name of it is multi-surface satin, da, 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 color. What color are you? Wine. Let's go with, I don't know if wine's gonna fit in here. Maybe too pink, purpley pink. It goes to the blue, the blue side. This other one is color, 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 tartan red. Oh, we'll put a couple of these down, see where, where they go color-wise. Tartan red, put a little bit down. Ooh, that is just red red. That is just simply red. I do have lipstick, which is also simply red. Yes, I'm making reference to the movie. I don't remember the movie, but I do remember the name of the movie. And I remember, I think that it was in the 80s. Simply Red. Oh, no, no, no. Simply Red. Duh. Music group. Simply Red. Good. Interesting. Some of their albums were interesting. Um, <laughs> you're like, wait, what? Some of their albums were interesting. Well, that's kind of not really an endorsement. Well, it's kind of an endorsement. All right, this is like super bright red. Let's see what we can do. These are almost the same colors. These are so similar. The the thicker one, where are you? Where are you, Martha? Martha Stewart one, the vine. One <laughs> vine, Jesus. No, tartan red, there we go. Tartan red is actually a little bit darker. I kind of like the tartan red better. It's a little bit less. So maybe we'll, I don't know what to do with this. So I'm going to start at the back. Safe place to go when you want to try something out is not the first place that you are looking. But let's go in here and see if I'm just going to use it as 
a further accent on the sides. Yep, just going to use this as an additional shade of red and bring it in next to it. That's actually pretty cool. Bring it in on top of this bulbous area. Because the other red that I have going is very pretty. It's already in the purpley spectrum. Uh, that red barn is barn red. Uh, it has significant amount of blue in it, which I didn't really realize until I compare it to one that doesn't have any blue. So I'm just going, you wanna see how I'm doing this. I'm going on one side of it, not on both. Because what this is gonna do is this is going to give me this tartan red, whoops, tartan red, which is the thicker Martha Stewart color, uh, on one side and it'll leave the barn red in the other places. Oh, and when I go over the orange, it's actually pretty freaking cool because it is not completely covering the orange. It's just sort of blending the orange under. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right, a lot of glare. There we go, that's better. Just bringing it right around. What it's very doing is adding more dimension. All right, I'm just gonna work my way around here. It's thickening it up, widening those pseudo veins a little bit, but not too much. I don't want them to become more than they need to be. And only doing it on one side, like I mentioned. Thicker in some areas, thinner in others. More sort of heavily applied in some areas. There we go. Easy peasy. Look at this. I'm going to go in where I have it inside between the quills or hairs or whatever these things are. Um, I haven't really decided what they are. I don't think I need to decide what they are, but I like them, whatever they are. And going with that. All right, so I'm going to go... I don't need to be need to be quick about it, but I am going to not spend a lot of time on it because I want it to just be an accent and added to it. Oops, that is way too thick. There we go. Nice thing about this is that oh, it's cool. It's coming over the orange and um, sort of muting the orange in places. Other places it's just giving a third color because I'm covering the bottom side of the red the you know the red that was on the bottom all right there we go makes them look I don't know different I like it the third color just seems to add dimension to everything whenever you do that so I don't remember I don't think I already, already redid this one so we're going to go right up and through here. So what brush am I using? I'm using the wedge brush, which tip. See it? Ta -da. And it's a nice little fine little brush for something like this. Uh, if you use a rounder tip brush, it is going to lay it on much heavier and thicker. And I don't want that. I want it sort of like a knife edge cut in as I go. And I just, as you can see, I'm rotating the brush rotate the brush as I go. Uh, that way I control where the paint is going and I can tell the paint where to go. Go to, you know where to go. Um, and I can wipe it off with my finger if I get it on there too heavily, which I am doing at times, but it's okay. Cause where is this going? Mantra, outside, that's right. So this is going to be down and around to the outside like that. This is going to be on that side here. Oh, that's really... All right, so that one was my favorite. That came out really cool. It's sort of breaking up these two colored lines in a way that gives it definitely more inter visual interest. Coming right up through here. I'm gonna go on both sides there. Ooh, way too much. Go on the bottom. Like 
this because that's what I've been doing. Staying consistent on the bottom, too thick, too thick. There we go. Comes right off, it's beautiful. So what I'm not doing is I'm not outlining it with this red. I'm using this red in addition to, keeping that in mind, that it's in addition to the other colors that are already here. I'm just putting on nice solid lines of it. So the deal is like when you're painting, it's like how, how many choices are you gonna make? How are you gonna make those choices for color? Um, and it depends on what you're painting. I mean, it completely depends on what you're painting, right? As to how incredibly important that, that, that color is, whatever that color might be. Um, for me, since I do so much, as I've mentioned in the past, large scale paintings is sort of my, my, my jig, my gig, my super happy place when it comes to painting. Uh, the large scale paintings, I do choose a palette at the beginning. So when I'm preparing a painting, preparing to start a painting, I decide on, they're going to be, it's going to be all shades of green or, um, green and this or green and that. And I will always choose three colors as my starting point. They do not need to be complementary colors. They often are just because then I know that they're not gonna make muddy brown. I mean, they can, if I'm not careful. Um, I can always choose to have muddy brown but oftentimes in mine, it's not really what I want. Um, although I have done that where it's been sort of brown in areas, uh, but not muddy necessarily. All right, here we go. Coming up. Going between. So anyway, so I pick the colors that I want to use from the beginning and I leave out just those colors for myself. So what I do is I kind of force myself in that palette. So I have this rise set triptych that I did. Rise set because it's the rising. It looks like a sunrise, but it also looks like it could be a sunset because you really don't know oftentimes with those the paintings. And I want it open to people's interpretation. So I just wanna make sure I'm not making this messy as I go. It's not, I'm liking it. It's making it just more substantial is really what it's coming down to, which is my happy, happy, happy thing. I'm good with that. So I'm going to come around here. When I start those paintings with that I added, you know, that the three colors palette that I've decided on or um, color choice or color story, some people call it, you know, some things. Um, which I kind of like that color story. Telling a story through color is pretty awesome. Um, there's so many ways to tell stories. It's kind of neat. I kind of like where it went. Now I'm going to bring it just on the, the down down parts. I'm not going to, well, where am I going to do it? I don't know. I'm going to just add a little bit in here. I've got the orange around the eye. Just bring a little bit more red. Because I've got that barn red, but just brighten it up a little bit. There we go. That's good. That worked beautifully. Go right around the eye a little bit more with this other red, a little bit brighter red. Yeah, and so after I've done that, oh, because I've already done it over here. Huh. Choice of colors, it forces me not into a box, but into a mentality. At first I was afraid to do that because I thought, oh my God, then I'm going to be restricting myself to my creative ability to just go wherever I want. Well, you know, going wherever you want, it's kind of like in writing, you know, do an outline, keep yourself to a focus. Going wherever you want in painting is great when you're doing something like this. But when you're doing a commission painting for someone who really liked this one, you know, something else you've done, 
and um, loves the color, colors and the feel of it, you got to study the painting that you did before to understand what you did. My paintings are very influenced by the music I listen to when I paint. I always have music on when I do my paintings, which is interesting to me because like when I study, when I was working on my masters and all of that stuff for years, I can't have any music on because I listen to and analyze music as I go. But I find that when I do paint, here we go, I'm putting a wash of the red on the lips, just on the tops. Um, it gets me in a groove and it does not do that for me when I'm studying. On the contrary, it gets me way out of a groove. It gets me unable to think because I, like I said, I sit and I analyze the music. I do chord structures and progressions and blah, 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 blah. You know how much of a... So my, my music teachers should be very proud that they made it so that I couldn't really listen to music anymore um, without it being work. Um, good work, but not just being able to sit and turn off the brain with it. I mean, that's my, that's my you know, baggage or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's not really something I wanted to work myself out of. I like being able to analyze music. So anyway, when I'm painting though, I do love to listen to music. And especially when I'm doing large scale paintings, because when I do large scale paintings, it's a full body experience. I mean like full body experience. I'm very aggressive on the canvas um, or with the canvas, at the canvas. And I, I'm aggressive in the application of the paint because it is a, a very kinetic experience for me to paint on large scale, which is why I really like it. Uh, it's very cathartic, it's very satisfying, um, but I do use the three colors and I'll often zone my canvas. That means that I'm gonna start in this, like if I've got a square, right? Or a rectangle, or a square, whatever. This corner is gonna be the yellow. This corner is gonna be the, the green, and maybe I'll do like a, yellow, green, blue. So it's a transitional type of thing coming from yellow to blue, but I choose an actual, actual like green paint that I have up in the other corner. Or the center will be the green, which is, which makes sense, right? You're coming from yellow. And I stay in um, sort of shades of yellow because I, as you know, I've got tons and tons and tons of samples and other sources of paint. And then I, I will mix it on, on the canvas. And I'll switch up brushes because I don't want everything to just be green. Because if you're yellow and you're blue, everything turns out green in the middle, which makes sense, right? Or, and what I want to do is I want to create depth. I want to create movement. I want I want your eye to be constantly drawn in places and a feeling of your, with my paintings, it's either a feeling of water or it's a feeling of sky and many layers that way. Um, but it's not a definitive, are you in water? Are you at the sky? Um, there's often a horizon on mine at some angle or, or even horizontal. And, but my, I work in, th in threes a lot with uh, painting. Now, why do I do that? Well, I found that it works well for me. When I was doing, when I just started doing that sort of thing, I found that I really connected to working in threes. So I work in threes and um, it took away, takes away. Oh, this is good. I'm liking where this went. Yeah, very cool. I may go over this with a black marker once it's all dried. Go down, define, maybe not. Maybe that's overworking it, maybe overthinking it. Uh, but anyway, so threes, how are we at three? 19 minutes, great. All right, so I'm gonna get a bigger brush. I'm gonna to move to different color schemes, different color palette, going with my browns. Here we go. <laughs> get some of the dark brown, a chunky dark brown. Get my middle brown. Oh, which is all water on the top because I didn't shake it. Um, oh, okay, oh, oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, good Lord, that is just a pump. 
pile. It literally is just water or whatever clear medium they use to suspend the solids. There we go. It's very, very thin compared to the other. And then the orange I'll leave for later. Using the browns, come back with my wider, larger brush. And this is a this is a firmer brush, um, still a synthetic bristle, but firmer. But I don't what I don't want to do, or what I do want to be careful of, is to um, use light pressure along these quills because they are um, delicate. They're glued on. They're solid, but they are definitely able to be popped right off if I push too hard on them. So, you know, my, my question then to myself is, and this, this brown, in, in, interestingly enough, it, this paint specifically dries a whole shade, like whole shade darker. Um, so you can't be like, I'm going to have this in my brain and this is the exact color I'm going to have. It's like, well, good for you, but that's not gonna happen. Let's live in today and in reality. So as I'm pulling these down, this color down the the, um, the shaft of these quills or whatever they are, these spikes, I um, have some pressure, consistent pressure all along the way, so I want it to apply. And I'm loading up my brush pretty heavily, pretty goopy, which is great. So, because then I'm gonna be using, I'll come, when I come back to them, I will use the next shade, which is the, brown sugar, which is a yellower brown that uh, is significantly lighter, but is a cool or excellent or neato <laughs> transition to the end. Gives it an ombre. I think that's what an ombre is. I'm pretty sure that's what an ombre is, where it goes from darker to lighter. And um, it'll be nice, smooth, darker to lighter, but significant enough. So they're not like right next to each other, um, but significant enough to be very noticeable. There we go. Look at that. It's going right on. I missed the whole side of that one when I was painting them earlier. So there we go. What I don't care about or what it what doesn't bother me what i enjoy on these is that that gray does show through a little and i'm really good with that because it gives more depth and more effect to it now these paints are satin finish do you know your paint finishes um i will sometimes work in different finish paints intentionally in order to create an effect. We are currently redoing our, or about to start, somebody, well, we're not uh, for a change. This is actually the first time I've ever been in the house that I haven't done all the renovations. It's kind of weird and cool. Very nerve wracking. I know what my capacities are and I know what, I know that people can do this a hell of a lot better than I can, but at least I know that I did it. So this is the first time we're having major construction on a house that we're living in, that it's not just me doing it. And, um, but so we're having the kitchen redone and the kitchen and dining room are being made into one room. There's a wall that's between them currently that will be taken down. And um, the it will be an open space, which I'm not all into full open spaces just because I don't, I, I'm just not a fan of my cooking space, being my living space, being my reading space, being my TV space, being my blah, 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 whole life space is in one place. I get it if you've got kids and you want to be able to keep track of your kids, like know exactly where they are in, in some general space, the entire, every second of their lives. But I don't have kids. I got dogs um, and I don't really need to know where they are at all times. I yell at them and they come do, 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 trotting toward me and they don't argue. So um, we chose not to have kids um, for many reasons. But so anyway, the, that completely open floor plan is just not my, not my jive. Um, I do like an opener, more open floor plan. We have a very separate dining room from 
our kitchen. Our kitchen is sort of, it's an eat-in eat kitchen. It's got, it's a beautiful space. It's actually very nice. It's done extremely well, designed well, executed well. Um, but it's, you know, dated, which is not a surprise, uh, considering our house was built in the 60s. But not dated in a, I don't, I, I like retro stuff. Like, I love stuff from the 60s and 70s, blah, 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 which is exactly what our house is. But this, the feeling of the space is very separate, very cut off. The kitchen is extremely cut off from the dining and living spaces, which is how it used to be, you know? You close all your doors to your kitchen, and it's nice is that it keeps all the odors out of the rest of the house. And we have actually swinging doors, which is pretty freaking awesome. Larry is actually very sad. He's, we have two swinging doors, not swinging doors, sorry. Yeah, swinging doors. They're like on hinges that, you know, are spring hinges. So you open them and they go, blah, 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 blah. they come back. I got two of those, we're getting rid of those because those are the ones that separate the kitchen from the entryway and the kitchen from the dining room. So with that, so the renovation is being done by someone else and that's about to start. And of course, we've been, you know, working on all the materials and choosing, good Lord, so many, you know, so many options for tile and flooring and um, countertops and cabinets and blah, 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 all those things that you choose when you completely redo a kitchen, when you take out a wall, put in an is a giant island, it's going to be really freaking cool, big island, um, and where my the gas cooktop will be in there with the downdraft uh, exhaust. Um, we were talking about doing, you know, a um, an exhaust coming down from the ceiling because we're also having them raise the ceiling, and um, they're going to do that. They're vault somewhat vaulting it, but they can only go up so far because of the way our roof is built. Blah blah blah, which is fine. Uh, we just adapt to that. But with that in mind. Um, we didn't want something hanging down and obscuring our view to outside because right now when you're in the kitchen You really don't have a connection to outside and that's our big thing with We absolutely adore mid-century um, Architecture always have before it was a, a fad Before everybody else was like, oh, let's make everything pseudo mid-century we've had All of our furniture has always been mid-century. It's just something that speaks to both of us and we we share that that real affinity to it, to that mid-century vibe. And mid-century being from, you know, for us, not 50s, which is kind of funny because that is truly like the mid-century, but it's the mid-century modern um, Scandinavian type of look, right? So you know the look, the clean lines, the, the um, kind of funky advanced technology ideas, all that stuff. And so, very California y, um, great lines, great architecture. And it's the connection of outside to inside that appeals to us most because Lee is a total inside cat. That boy is basically a mosquito magnet. And whenever he goes out, you want to be about six feet away from him because no mosquito will pay you mind at all because they're just going right for. Early. Um, he's got the sweet blood and let me tell you it is weird because I'll be sitting there and I'll be getting chewed up by mosquitoes and the next thing I know uh, Lee comes out and there's not a mosquito around me and he's dying um, <laughs> so, it's pretty funny um, Anyway, so we've been choosing all of that. And so what I was talking about is the finishes of paint. That's to come full round circle on my diatribe and my um, tangent uh, about all of the way too much information about our kitchen. But, so we found this great backsplash tile that we loved. It's very denim -y. We're trying to stay sort of in a monochromatic concept of blacks and blues um, for the main part of the kitchen for the countertops and the island is you know monochromatic not really but you know that grayish blue type of thing and sort of a not the bright denim blue but the sort of faded denim 
The bottom cabinets are this beautiful navel blue. Uh, they're in a satin finish. And the top cabinets are in this gray. And it's just a, it's a warm gray. It's not grayish, as they call it, gray beige, which is now a color, apparently. Um, it, people do refer to it as grayish, which is kind of wild and I kind of like that, that um, sort of blending of the two terms, not gray, not beige, it's, it's both beige and gray. So it's what we would call gray on the, in the red spectrum. Anyway, so the backsplash that we had chosen was this beautiful, look like handmade tile. Um, I mean, gorgeous, really cool. And we're gonna stack them vertically. So they're, you know, two by, two by six tiles and we're not doing the subway tile layout, but we're laying them out so that they go like this. And then the next row goes directly on top of them with all of the seams lining up. Um, and then, you know, so it creates this, it's called a European. I didn't know this until I was watching one of those renovation. So it's a European layout. Who knew that we were so fancy? Um, but anyway, so that was what we had chosen. Well, Lee had a dream. He really did. He actually did. Had a dream where he was just like, suddenly the the tile was not, he had a dream that there was a discontent for the tile that we had all chosen and been okay with. The weird part about this whole thing is that I did not go with them to choose tile. It was Lee and Larry, they went by themselves. I had to work, um, which is fine, but and I was like, send me pictures, send me pictures. Well, they sent me like two pictures of their final choices. And I was like, that's not sending me pictures so I can participate. And so they had found a couple of them, got themselves set on it, which is fine. They did. I liked it. I thought it was beautiful. And Lee was just like, I don't know, there's something that will kill me, but I'm just not satisfied with it. I had a dream that we need to revisit this and rethink it, blah, blah, blah. So we went back in and, you know, we're going through. I'm like, I'm going to look through every single thing of tiles. Did you guys look through everything, every single one? No, we didn't. We kind of went in one direction and we just stayed in that direction. I'm like, all right, well, I'm pulling out every single one of them of the samples and I'm going to look at every single possible tile combination that's in blues um, or something like sort of bluish E. Well, I found these really cool little tiles. They're so cool. They're little, they're almost like a teardrop, a double teardrop, a diamond. So it looks like a diamond, but it's like teardroppy corners, edges, like rounded. And they have, listen to this, matte and gloss in the same pattern, in the same tile. And they're small, they're only like, the, literally each one is only this big, right? But there's a percentage, 70% of them are matte, 30% randomly when they're put on the thing are gloss. And what's really cool is that suddenly when you have a satin finish, when you have a matte finish on something, and then you put a gloss finish on it, it literally, because of the reflection of the light or the whatever, the the, the interplay of light, how it, light is, bounces off of that, they, the base color is exactly the same, but the finish makes them look like they're two different colors of blue. It's absolutely brilliant and beautiful. So you can do the same thing with the finish on of your paint that you choose. Like these paints, they say they're satin. They're pretty darn flat to me. Um, but so when you have a satin finish or a matte finish on uh, for your paint, when it dries, it's going to tend to look darker because when it's wet, it's reflecting a lot of light. Therefore, when it dries, it's not reflecting all of that light and is a trick of the eye that it looks significantly darker. So just a little trick, really long story and explanation of how the finish can affect the actual color of the paint that you're using. All right, well, I'm at 34 minutes. Good Lord, I'm over. So I'm just going to continue with these. Um, I told you I wouldn't do work while I'm not on the screen, but I'm going to just going to tell you what I'm going to do because I only have a few left and uh, I'm going to get actually through them and finish them up because I got to go up to dinner. Dinner's going to be ready in a few minutes anyway. Um, so I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope that you like and subscribe, like it and make comments. 
I love the comments. Keep send in your comments and um, I will respond to them. I know, right? Crazy. Um, if they're nasty comments, I won't respond to them. I will delete them. I, I've got the power. So have a fabulous day. Treat yourself well. Put the love out in the world. There's not enough love in the world. There truly isn't. And love yourself. Allow yourself to love yourself. Allow yourself to love yourself. You be you. But also be patient with yourself. Give yourself more room than you than you probably have to take a breath and then respond emotionally or mentally, however you're responding. All right, take that moment and give yourself time and space. All right, I hope you have a great day. Red finger. <laughs> Bye.